Good afternoon. Welcome to today's CASA webinar, Survey Research Methods, Designing Survey Instruments. Survey Research Methods is part of a webinar series, Statistical Tools for Attorneys in Litigation. During this program, we've covered introduction to data, the basic tools, and survey research methods. Today, we will cover designing survey instruments. The presenter will cover the three important steps in designing survey instruments, composing a question, creating item scales, and conducting questionnaires. The presenter for today's program is Dr. Jack Ravel. Dr. Ravel is a PhD and a consulting statistician with his degree in industrial engineering and management from Oklahoma State University. Dr. Ravel provides his technical assistance in both quality and industrial engineering to attorneys involved in litigation. We'll take two question and answer breaks during today's program. If you have a question, please use the chat feature or Q&A feature located on the right-hand side of the screen to submit your question to the presenter. We encourage all attendees to submit questions throughout the presentation. Tomorrow morning, I'll send out an email with a link to the archived recording of this program, as well as a copy of the PowerPoint presentation used during today's program. I now invite you to sit back, relax, and enjoy. I'm going to turn the presentation over to our distinguished guest, Dr. Jack Ravel. Jack, the program is all yours. Thank you very much, Matt, and uh, good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you are, uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, as Matt mentioned earlier, uh, this is part of a continuing series of webcasts for attorneys in litigation. Uh, this is part two of four parts on the subject of survey research methods. Uh, Let's, let's see what we have to say today. Well, this is a, a little background on myself if you're interested. Uh, I've been in and out of uh, quality and statistics uh, and industrial engineering for the best part of uh, about 40 years and have been recognized by a number of different organizations uh, for the work that I've accomplished. And today, uh, as I mentioned just a moment ago, we're going to be into part three of this series of uh, webcast for TASA and TASA's uh, clients, this one on survey research methods. Last time we did a presentation, it was on phase one of research, survey research methods, and those are the ones in red. Uh, we talked about initiating a survey, planning a project, and designing a sample. Today, as Matt mentioned just a moment ago, we are in phase two. We'll be talking about uh, section four on composing a question. Number five, creating item scales, and number six, constructing questionnaires. In the future uh, webcasts to follow this, we'll get into phase three, talking about collecting and processing data. That'll be section seven, eight, and nine, mail data collection, gathering interview data, and processing the data. And finally, uh, in phase four, talking about interpreting and reporting results. Uh, that will include item, uh, section 10, analyzing the results, section 11, interpreting the statistics, and finally, number 12, perhaps the most important of all, reporting the information to those persons who need the data and the interpretation of the data uh, so as to make their case. So let's get started now with phase two, designing survey instruments. First, as I mentioned, we'll be talking about Section 4 on uh, composing questions. This is the core of the survey. And, uh, the basic attributes of the questions uh, should include very specific laser-like focus, brevity, and clarity. We have to be extremely cautious how we express the questions to avoid the potential for, for bias. And, of course, you want to use the most appropriate uh, grammar in order to make sure that the people who are uh, either reading or hearing the questions uh, understand that you're they're dealing with professionals. We want to make sure that uh, we avoid bias and error in our questions. Uh, there, should no, there should not be any unstated criteria uh, or inapplicable questions. There should be example containment, over-demanding recall, uh, no overgeneralizations, no overspecificity, no overemphasis, no ambiguity of wording, no double-barreled questions, no leading questions, and no loaded questions. These are important criteria 
uh, for us to follow when we're putting together a, a survey instrument uh, in support of whatever case you may be working on. Uh, anything less than this, and you may end up with uh, information that's not exactly what you're looking for. Some of the sources of response bias are social desirability, acquiescence, yay and naysaying, prestige, threat, hostility, auspices, mental set, order, and extremity. With all these sources of response bias, as you might expect, we need to be extremely cautious. We also have to be concerned about the question format, uh, the dimension of the answers, uh, the comparability of data, recording accuracy, response task, and inappropriate reasons. Now, here's an example of some questions. Uh, at the top of the slide are what we call an unstructured item, and at the bottom, a structured item. In the unstructured item, the question is, why did you leave, or excuse me, why did you visit this store? And you get a choice. You can say uh, you might check all seven of them or just one or, or two or three. Uh, that's unstructured, open-ended, if you will. As opposed to the structured item at the bottom of the page, which says what's the one major reason you visited this store? And there are seven different ones, and you can specify uh, whether it's the price of the goods or the selection of the merchandise. Uh, these are the ones that you, you see very uh, very often if you've gone to a restaurant and they, they give you a, uh, uh, a, an opportunity to uh, dial in or to uh, uh, use your computer to respond to their questions relative to uh, the, the quality of the food or the service uh, that you received uh, when you uh, attended a, a restaurant recently. Now, another way you can do this is to do an advanced structured item, and that is to have those same seven and prioritize them. So, for example, if the price of the goods was the major reason, you'd give that a number one. If selection of merchandise was second most important, you'd give that a number two. And many, many uh, restaurants that uh, I've, I've seen their uh, questionnaires that they, they provide uh, for survey response uh, to their, uh, their customers uh, have used that particular approach. Now, let's talk about composing questions, specifically, what are the things that we need to keep clear in our minds? First, focus very precisely. Keep each item brief. Strive for clarity. Use a core vocabulary. Use simple sentences. Avoid specific sources of bias or error. Use structured questions. Classify your answers carefully. Choose appropriate categories and use scaling effectively. Now let's let's give a kind of a, a brief discussion for each one of these regarding focus very precisely. Every item should zero in and very very directly on one specific issue or topic. Keep items brief. The longer the question, the greater the response task, and the more error and bias potential. Strive for clarity. Every respondent must know exactly what's being asked. Use core vocabulary. Use the same words as the least sophisticated respondents would use in common speech, so you have to know who your audience is. You know, are you going to be writing at a seventh grade level? Uh, are you going to be writing at a high school level? Are you writing at a college level? It depends on who you're uh, expecting to have answer your, your questions. Use simple sentences. Two or more simple sentences are far preferable to one compound sentence. Avoid specific sources of bias or error. Be sure your items are free from the factors that create bias and error. Use structured questions. Unstructured items ordinarily provide large quantities of poor quality data. Classify your answers carefully. Observe the three rules for an effective classification system. Those three rules First, a list must be all-inclusive, meaning it should include every possible response. The second rule, categories must be mutually exclusive, meaning that if, it's, if you pick one, it can't be the other. Uh, a number can't be odd and even, for example. They must be mutually exclusive. And the third of the three rules is there should be more variance 
in the meaning between categories than within them. Next, choose appropriate categories. Be certain they're neither too broad nor too narrow, nor too many, nor too few. And finally, use scaling effectively. Section 5, which follows, offers guidance on numeric and verbal scales to combine and combining survey items into groups. So let us move on then to section 5 on creating item scales. We need to concern ourselves with why scales are used, the use of multiple choice questions, conventional scale types, scale combinations, nonverbal scales, and scale selection criteria. Now, in a, in a brief one-hour uh, webcast like this, uh, there's no way we can cover all of these, but I will cover some highlights. For example, uh, let's talk about the paired comparison scale. Uh, paired comparisons are used extensively in all kinds of work. For example, uh, here we're looking at a, for each pair of soft strings listed below, uh, please put a check mark by the one you, you most prefer if you have to choose between the two. And there's uh, Pepsi-Cola versus Coca-Cola, Royal Crown versus Pepsi, Royal Crown versus Like, Royal Crown versus Coca-Cola, Coca-Cola versus Like, Like Cola versus Pepsi. In each case, you're picking the, the one that you prefer of the two. And we can use very simple mathematics then uh, that helps us to uh, determine which has the, the greater preference. Now, that's just a, a very simple example of a paired comparison scale. Now let's look at the semantic differential scale. Now, we have on the left one uh, limit, and on the right a different limit, hot versus cold, bland versus spicy, expensive versus inexpensive. And you notice that the question at the top, which comes from a pizzeria, please put a check mark in the space on each line below to show your opinion of the pizza served here. If you think it's extremely hot, obviously you're going to put a check mark by the number one in the hot versus cold line. If you think it's very cold, you're going to uh, check a seven uh, next to cold. If it's right in the middle, you'll check a four. And you have this thematic differential and on a, a scale of seven. Now, you don't have to use seven. Uh, you could use uh, five. You could use three. It depends on uh, how specific or how precise you want to be in this semantic differential scale. Now let's talk about another semantic scale, this one, the semantic distance scale. It says, pick a number from the scale to show how well each word or phrase below describes your job and jot it in the space in front of each item. So that's pretty easy. Uh, no pun intended there with the, uh, the first word being easy. Uh, if you say your job is, uh, is not at all easy, you give it a one. Uh, if it's uh, very perfectly exactly what you want, you give it a seven. And you go through and you're going to be doing this. This is almost like a paired comparison, but in a more disguised way. Because if you look in the left-hand column at the top, you find the word easy. But if you look in the right-hand column, three items down, you find difficult. So you can see there, there is a, a paired comparison going on here. If you go down to uh, the third one in the left-hand column, it says boring. And if you go down to uh, the fourth from the bottom on the right-hand column, it says uh, pleasant. And, for example, over in the uh, left-hand column, you see the fifth one down is low-paying. And the fourth one down in the right-hand column is rewarding. These are just simple, some examples of showing uh, from one end of the spectrum to the other. But in this particular one, the semantic distance scale, all we're trying to do uh, is to get a better idea of how people feel about, the, in this case, their job, and jot it in the, uh, the space in front of each item. And let's see. Uh, that takes care of the semantic distance scale. Let's talk about creating item scales. First of all, we want to keep it simple. You know, we're not working with the... Uh, uh, PhD mathematicians, statisticians, you want to respect the respondent. You, you want to dimension or size the response. Pick the denominations, whether you're going to be dealing with 1 through 7, 1 through 5, 
one through three, whatever it may be, and I always advocate using an odd number because it at least gives the, the, the respondent the opportunity to select something in the middle as opposed to using even numbers, which forces them to be on one side or the other of the middle. Choose the range. Group only when required. Handle neutrality carefully. Date instructions clearly. Always be flexible. And pilot test the scale. Now let's go through those in some great detail, and then we'll take our break. First, keep it simple. Given a choice between a very short, concise scale and a more elaborate, sophisticated one, a less complex scale should be used. Even after identifying a scale to be used for an item, ask, is there an easier, simpler way, simpler scale or way of asking this question? Respect the respondent. While the respondents are ordinarily cooperative and helpful, response is a favor. They have little involvement with the task. Select scales that will make it as quick and easy as possible for them. That will reduce the non-response bias and improve accuracy. Dimension the response. In what dimensions do respondents and sponsors think about the issue? They'll not always be the same, so some commonality must be discovered. The dimensions along which the respondents are to answer must not be obscure or difficult, and they should parallel respondents' thinking. Pick the denominations. Always use the denominations that are best for respondents. The data can later be converted to the denominations sought by information seekers. Feet and inches can be changed to metric or time covered to a 24-hour clock during processing. Next, choose the range. Categories or scale increments should be about the same breadth as those ordinarily used by respondents. Normally, Respondents classify things into a range from about two to about seven or eight categories, and seldom more than ten. Respondents often can't be as precise as researchers would like. Group, only when required. Never put things into categories when they can easily be expressed in numeric terms. People think in years, not decades or centuries. Data can always be grouped during processing, but if obtained in broad categories, it can't be desegregated later, no, no matter how desirable that may be. Next, handle neutrality carefully. If respondents genuinely have no preference, they'll resent the forced choice inherent in a scale with an even number of alternatives, which I mentioned earlier. If feelings aren't especially strong, an odd number of, of scale points may result in fence riding or piling on the midpoint even when some preference exists. Next, state instructions carefully. Even the least capable respondents must be capable, excuse me, must be able to understand. Use language that's typical of the respondents. Explain exactly what the respondents should do and the task sequence they should follow. List the criteria by which they should judge and use an example or practice item if there's any doubt. Always be flexible. Scaling examples provided here are only that. They can, they can and should be modified to fit the task and the respondents. The instructions, format, vocabulary, and number of scale points can be changed to, to suit the needs of the survey. Scales should fit the task, not conform to the original author's specifications. And finally, pilot test the scale. When there's any doubt about the ability of the respondents, to use the scales, a brief in informal pilot test is a quick, inexpensive insurance. Don't wait until the entire questionnaire is written. Individual parcels can be checked with a few typical respondents. Well, that's us about creating item scales. Let's take our, uh, our mid-webcast uh, break, and I'll, I'll take any questions that Matt uh, might uh, receive from from you folks that are uh, listening and watching. And when we're through with the break, we'll move on to uh, the final section, six, on constructing questionnaires. Matt, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Jack. And uh, if anybody in the audience has a question for Jack, please use the chat or Q&A feature found on the right-hand side of the screen um, to submit your questions. 
Um, Jack, in this last item, you touched on kind of uh, the best practices. Um, have you seen, and I'm sure you have, instances where these best practices have not been followed? And um, what's the result of not following these best practices? Well, the, probably the, the best that example I can give you is when somebody thinks, someone who has never done a questionnaire before and thinks it's a very simple, straightforward thing to do, does it on their own, and sends it out and gets answers, and then contacts a statistician like myself and says, would you please interpret this for me? And because the questions were either biased or ambiguous, uh, or because they were too, the questions were too complex as opposed to being simple, or because they were too broad and, and general rather than being very specific and, and laser-like, uh, you end up with information that the, the statistician, no matter how good he or she may be, uh, can't do anything with. You can't turn uh, garbage into, into something that smells good uh, just because you've got somebody uh, that's worked with garbage before. So the best thing I can recommend is uh, if you're intending to uh, conduct a survey, develop a questionnaire, whether it's going to be uh, administered face-to-face uh, -face with a, uh, a respondent and a person who's asking the questions, or whether it's going to be done uh, in the form of an email, or whether it's going to be done in the form of a hard copy questionnaire, is that you work extensively with a statistician who has experience in dealing with this kind of thing, and then before you do anything, because even a statistician whose experience can make a mistake, uh, administer it, as I, as I mentioned before, to pilot test the, the scales and the questions so as to make sure that the questions are understandable, uh, that the responses that you're looking for make sense, and that you're going to be able to put the data to use and interpret it in such a way uh, that you're going to be able to make your case. Okay, great. We have a question here from Steve who asks, um, he's a member of a state bar house of delegates, and he would like to send a survey about how the membership in his region views the bar's ethics complaints process, so evaluating a process. Are there any uh, best practices or references that you can provide to Steve um, in preparation to formulate this, this survey or questionnaire? Yeah, I, I would suggest uh, that the uh, first thing you do is he uh, talk to some of his colleagues and get some of their ideas and what they think uh, the problems are, and they could use that as a kind of a pilot questionnaire, just like you sometimes have a pilot parachute to pull out the main parachute. I would suggest using a, a pilot questionnaire uh, and, and find out what are the things that they think should be asked about to develop a list of topics that should be included and then then develop the full the full blown questionnaire rather than just try and have one or two people do it all by themselves. And then uh, when the results come back, uh, one of the best things you, one of the best things you can do is be, uh, as you send out the original questionnaire is indicate that only those persons who respond to the questionnaire will get the results. And then when the results are, are completed and interpreted, uh, each of the persons who were generous enough of their time and their effort uh, to respond to the questionnaire will receive a copy of uh, the, uh, the final interpretation, both by uh, uh, Steve and the, and the, uh, the uh, statistician that he's working with. Okay, great. I don't see any other questions in the queue, so why don't we continue on with the presentation of content, Jack? Okay, and by the, by the way, uh, I, I'm going to suggest, I don't know if you can do this or not, uh, to be honest, Matt, uh, you might want to give uh, Steve my uh, email address, and uh, have, if you have him email me, I'd be happy to discuss this with him either on an, in an email uh, or uh, uh, by phone, either way. Oh, definitely. I will uh, I will definitely send uh, Steve your contact information. And Steve, I know you're listening because you just acknowledged it. I will send out uh, Dr. Ravel's uh, email information um, after this program's over. Okay. And, and by the way, I noticed that uh, Steve is in Oregon, and he may or may not be aware of the fact uh, that I live just a bit south of him uh, in California. I live uh, in Orange, California. So, uh, it, the, uh, there's not any uh, time zone differential you'd have to be concerned with. All right, excellent. Yeah, I'll make that connection, um, like I said, after the program's over. Definitely look for an email from me and Steve and Jack. 
Okay. Ready to go now? Yes, please, please uh, continue on with the presentation. Okay. Now we go to section six, the third and final section uh, of this uh, second in a series of four presentations on survey research methods. First, we'll talk about the construction of questionnaires, uh, specifically the function of the questionnaire, to what purpose, for example, using Steve's uh, example, uh, we, I'm sure he's concerned about making sure that uh, they are focusing on the, the right items or concerns of the members of the bar in Oregon. Then we'll want to talk about creating sec questionnaire sections. You know, you're going to have an introductory section, a general section, uh, and then there'll be some specific sections, a section one on topic X, a section two on topic Y, a section three on, on topic Z, et cetera. And a final conclusion, some of the questions uh, may be open-ended, uh, and some may be closed-ended, some may be differentials, uh, uh, pair comparisons of the type that we talked about. Then you want to talk about the uh, directing response flow, uh, concluding the questionnaire, and pre-testing the questionnaire. Pre-testing questionnaires is something that a lot of people don't think about, but it's a, it's a great move. Uh, you know, if you're, if you're talking to or, or, or communicating with uh, multiple people, uh, it doesn't hurt to have five out of 50 or five out of 100 uh, tested say, I like this one, I don't like this one, and why? so that they, you can do whatever needs to be done to reconstruct or, or repair uh, the original question or questions uh, that you're considering providing uh, as a part of your uh, survey. Now let's talk about the topic summary for constructing the questionnaires. As you can see, there's a, quite a few of them. Uh, let's talk about each one in order. First, we'll talk about emphasizing the introduction. Most refusals to respond will come immediately. And once respondents begin, they seldom terminate prematurely, unless, and I will add this, unless the questioner has become so long and so tedious and so repetitive that they say, I'm just tired of this, and they'll cut it off right in the middle. That you can avoid a lot by making your, your questionnaire uh, the right length, uh, the right topics, uh, easy to use, easy to understand, without a great deal of, of uh, thought on the part of the respondent. Next item, check the sequence carefully. Simple, interesting, informative items should come first, and sensitive or threatening items as late as possible. You don't start out with a biggie and, th and throw a punch in the, in the person's face. Next, group items into section. Combined items that use the same scales or put the same topics into sections to facilitate response and simplify the task. Next, limit and control branching. Make branch instructions simple, clear, and concise and avoid complex branching or multiple branches as much as possible. You know how when you're having a conversation with somebody and Somebody throws in a red herring and you go off on a tangent in another direction, that's branching. And it makes it difficult, very difficult, uh, to come back to the original topic without losing the thread of uh, what a person is thinking about. Use ample instructions. An instruction should be included if there's any doubt, and they, but they must be simple enough for the least sophisticated respondent. Don't overestimate interviewers or respondents. Sophistication and motivation are always less than the researcher is likely to expect. Make good use of rating cards. For personal interview surveys, good rating cards will simplify the task and increase reliable, valid responses. Next to last, be sure to pre-code responses and record formats. Pre-coding must be done very precisely and accurately and submitted to the acid test. And finally, as you've heard me say before, always pretest the entire questionnaire on a pilot sample. Try 5, 10, 20, even 30, observing closely as they respond to the instrument. 
when you use these uh, responses on the pretest, I can virtually guarantee your questionnaire will be far better received and responded to than if you don't. Now let's come up with some examples uh, for here this phase two that we're in. For section four, where we talked about uh, composing questions, the attorney and the SME, that is the subject matter expert statistician, team up to develop survey questions. For section five, where we're talking about creating item scales, the attorney and the SME statistician team up to select response scale. And finally, in section six on constructing questionnaires, the attorney and the SME statistician team up to finalize the questionnaire. So as you can see, this is a shoulder to shoulder uh, working together. The statistician doesn't go off to his or her uh, cave and put this whole thing together. It's a lot of iterations, a lot of back and forth, okay? like playing catch. Uh, how about if I say this? What if you say that? Back and forth. And the time that you invest up front to develop the very best possible questionnaire you can will pay dividends in the accuracy and the quality of the responses that you receive in an effort uh, to come up with the, the conclusions that you're looking for so you know what action or actions to take. That's my presentation for today. I'm open to any uh, additional questions that uh, uh, the uh, attendees may have. Up to you, Matt. All right, no, I think this is great, and thank you so much, Jack. I would like to open up uh, the floor to questions, and uh, if you have a question, as I said previously, please use the chat feature. The Q&A feature is just down on the right-hand side of the screen to submit your question, and we'll get your question answered in a timely manner. Jack, talking about um, all of this kind of holistically, uh, some of the attendees, this is the first time they've joined us, um, when they're putting together a questionnaire like this, in previous programs you've talked about sample size and population and all that sort of thing. Can you briefly discuss that, um, for instance, with the example of the Oregon State Bar? Um, I'm guessing that, the, the, or I'm assuming that the, the survey will be sent out to, um, to most of the members, but in order to get a, a confidence level of 95 or 99 percent, how many of those people will have to respond? Do you know over kind of how that works um, and what folks should think about when when developing a questionnaire to get to maximize the number of responses? The first thing I, I will do uh, is remind everybody that uh, you have very generously archived all the presentations I have made previously where I've talked about those subjects in, in some great detail. Now, what I'll do is, is talk about it very generally now, but then urge people who are concerned about uh, sample size selection uh, and confidence levels and maximum allowable error and all that sort of thing, uh, that they, sh they should refer back uh, to the archived webcast that uh, TASA has maintained of the, of the previous presentations that I have made. So with regard to uh, sample size as an example, there are uh, several formulas for it to be specific uh, that are available. Uh, it's simply a matter for determining sample size. You need to know what confidence level you want to work with. For example, if you're dealing with something, uh, sending something to uh, to the moon or Mars, you're going to probably want a confidence level of like 99 or 99.9 percent. Uh, if you're dealing with something about uh, uh, how uh, something that has to do with health, you're probably concerned with like the 99 percent. Uh, but as you get into less hazardous territory, uh, a lot of companies will use 95% confidence, 90% confidence. Where is the time that I, I would see a, uh, a confidence level that is psychologically acceptable that is less than 90%? Than 90%. Uh, it's a, strictly a psychological thing because who says that 88% isn't virtually just as good as, as 95%? Now, uh, at, the, at the moment, this, this telecast, uh, this webcast is being uh, recorded, uh, is right in the middle of the 2012 uh, presidential uh, season, and you're seeing surveys virtually every few days on who's ahead, and it, it varies, and they always talk about the margin of error. Now, this is important because uh, when, you, when you start developing your questionnaires and trying to figure out how big a sample you need, 
you have to say, how big a margin of error are you going to have? For example, if you're only willing to accept a margin of error of, let's say, 1%, you're going to need a far larger sample size than if you're willing to accept a margin of error of 4% or 5%. It's a trade-off because the larger the margin of error, the less certain you are that the responses you have uh, is, is precisely or is very close uh, to the actual number at the, at, the, at the time. But it's a matter of time and money. Uh, if, you, if you're going to have to have a, uh, a sample size of, uh, make a number up of, of 5,000, that's going to take you longer to get or be more expensive because you have more people involved in data collection than if you only need 1,000 people or 500 people. So in sitting down with a uh, statistician, you need to decide what the compromises are going to be. How big a sample size are you willing to pay for? Uh, how much time are, is, it, will, are, is it going to take to conduct the survey? Uh, what kind of budget do you have uh, to handle this thing? For example, with, with Steve in Oregon, uh, since this is part of the, the uh, state bar, you know, is the state bar going to be uh, underwriting the cost of the, uh, of, the, of the survey that's going to be going out? And if that's the case, I'm sure he's going to have a, a budget constraint that he's going to have to face. And then, of course, uh, you're also going to be talking about, in addition to margin of error and confidence level, uh, you're going to be talking about uh, a variety of other uh, inputs. Like, for example, in previous surveys, you know, what was the standard deviation? That is the, uh, the measure of variance that may occur uh, w within the responses. Or are you going to use uh, uh, proportions as opposed to specific numbers? Uh, like if you said that uh, the average on this question was uh, 3.5 out of 4 with a standard deviation of uh, 0.05, as opposed to saying 40% uh, said yes and 60% said no. Uh, there's so many questions, so many, so many mathematical uh, concerns that we have that literally each opportunity for a survey stands on its own. And I'd, I'd love to be able to give you a rule of thumb that says you know, it's always this or it's always that. Because i, I got to be honest, my friends, it just isn't always that way. Uh, someone's going to come up and say, I need, uh, but I need to have this or I need to have that. And that's going to change the output. That's going to change your numbers. So whatever you're going to do, probably the most important thing you can do is first get yourself a, a statistician that you trust, that you've got good chemistry with, that you feel comfortable with, and then work with that statistician, he or she, uh, to develop your questions, to pre-test the questionnaire, uh, to send out the, the, uh, the questionnaires, uh, whether it's done uh, electronically or by snail mail or whatever the case may be, and then work with the, the statistician in the responses that, the, that he or she is getting to make sure that the answers you're going to get are useful in, in making decisions about what actions should be taken as a result of the survey. Because if no actions are taken, why did you bother to do it in the first place? Matt? Okay, thank you so much, um, Jack, for that answer. Um, going back to, to questionnaires, I would, um, I would imagine that there are a, a multiple number of uses for questionnaires in a legal matter. Can you give some examples of uh, questionnaires, where you've seen or how you've seen questionnaires used in cases and uh, what you think they are best used for? Yeah, the, uh, I recently worked on a, on a case where uh, there was some question as to whether or not an individual uh, should have been uh, let go uh, from his job because uh, two years before he received an, except, an exceptional survey an exceptional evalu uh, annual survey, annual evaluation. Uh, the following year, he received one that was just a little bit below average, and based on that, the, uh, his employer let him go. And the attorney I was working with was looking to uh, be able to compare this person's evaluations against the average evaluations uh, of the rest of the company, which he got through discovery. And uh, so we, we did a survey on that to find out uh, what was going on. Uh, I've had other, other surveys uh, that I've had to do where people were, com uh, a particular person uh, complained that there was a uh, sexual harassment in the workplace. And so what we, had to, what we had to do is develop a survey about that subject and then uh, 
take that information and see if this person uh, that sensed a great deal of sexual harassment in the workplace uh, was was on the money, or if in fact they, that uh, we found uh, that this person was overly sensitive and that there was absolutely no evidence of uh, uh, of this kind of uh, atmosphere or culture in the company. Uh, anytime there's a value that you want to question and you want to compare it uh, to some other uh, database survey is probably the best way to do it, especially if, if you want current valid data. Something that happened five years ago is not necessarily indicative uh, of today's culture uh, or today's uh, uh, the kind of thing that goes on today. So uh, I've I dealt with a, uh, a uh, an individual recently within the last week or two who's thinking of doing a survey, and uh, he's he's uncertain as to what exactly what the survey is going to be about. But I was able to help him uh, in other ways when he started to describe the situation he was dealing with. Uh, he said, uh, "Oh my gosh," he says, "That's you know that's a pretty good question." Uh, that's something that they hadn't even considered. So you can't lose by talking to a statistician. Uh, I probably give away too much, but uh, uh, just in, in the first uh, discussions, uh, I'll, I'll ask this, a, uh, an attorney, Do you, have you considered this? Have you considered that? Have you done this? Uh, and sometimes they'll say, yes, we have. And other times, as it was uh, just within the last week or so, they'll say, no, we haven't. And it's something we need to consider. So... Uh, I, I think that's about it. Okay, hey, great. And you talked about um, during uh, the first couple slides of the presentation, you talked about knowing your audience and, and formatting your questionnaire or survey um, so that your audience can understand it. On average, would you say that you should, you know, grade your survey so that someone with a 7th grade education, 12th grade education, what have you found? Um, is kind of the sweet spot for, um, for um, uh, I guess, writing to, to that audience? Well, it really varies. I, I would hope that the uh, uh, grade level for a, uh, a collection of attorneys would be much higher than that for a bunch of folks that are working in a machine shop. Uh, first of all, because the average level of education for attorneys is much higher than it is for folks in a machine shop. I'm not talking about IQ. I'm talking about the amount of education they've received. Uh, I guess, geez, you know, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure that I can give you a really good answer on that, Matt. Uh, there is a thing called a, I'm trying to, I'm trying to think what it's called, uh, where you can do a, I, I, I've lost it, it's not, it's not on the tip of my tongue. But there are ways of determining what grade level uh, a particular uh, cont uh, content, a paragraph or a page or whatever it might be, is being written at. Uh, I'd, have to, I'd have to do a uh, some research on Google. But I know that uh, back years ago when I was the chief statistician at Use Aircraft, uh, we did some surveys and found out that the average set of work instructions that were being used in the machine shop were written at about the uh, ninth or tenth grade level, which you think, gee, that should be great. Except that when they did a test of the individuals who were working in the machine shop, they were reading at about a fifth or sixth grade level. That differential between the grade levels, between what was written and their ability to, uh, to comprehend, made for a lot of defects in the products that were being produced. Oh, definitely. And we have a, com or a comment here from Steve. Now, the worrying is says that the average juror in the U.S. has, has a seventh grade education. Wow. Well, I guess that doesn't surprise me. Right. Um, excellent. Well, I don't see any other questions in the queue. So, Jack, do you have any uh, concluding remarks that you would like to make, and we'll uh, we'll wrap up today's program. Well, I'm just uh, this is personal advice, and that is based on my experience, and I've been doing this stuff, as I say, for about 40 years. Um, when you think you may need to do a survey or use a statistician in any in any way, talk to the statisticians uh, that, that TASA may recommend for you. Uh, 
and determine whether or not you feel comfortable working with that person. Because no matter uh, how much experience they have uh, or, or how long they've been doing something, if you can't work with that person comfortably, you got the wrong person. Uh, I won't say it's like getting married, but the fact is that you're going to be working very closely with this person uh, for an abbreviated uh, uh, time, all the way from the development of a, uh, a survey or some sort of statistical test, all the way to uh, uh, going to going to court and uh, and taking that person's testimony. So. Uh, Make sure you're working with somebody that you feel comfortable with. And uh, when you've got that person's, when you've got the comfort level uh, issue out of the way, make sure that this person has the credentials and the experience uh, that you feel uh, is sufficient to help you to get the job done to take care of winning your case. Okay, thank you, Jack, and thank you for uh, another excellent uh, presentation. I really appreciate the. Uh, the time and effort that you put into the program. Um, thank you to everybody who attended today's program. If you would like to speak to Dr. Revelle about a specific case or matter, you can contact us here at CASTER number 800-523-2319. We'll be sending out the link to the archived recording of this program tomorrow morning, and in that email, I'll include a copy of the PowerPoint presentation. Our next webinar for legal professionals applying human factors to liability cases will take place on September 26, 2012, at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. And finally, if you have any follow-up questions or comments on how we can improve the program, uh, we do take all of your comments under consideration. They help us to produce better programs. Uh, please send me an email to mhide at catsonet.com, and we will uh, we will get you or we will take your information and we will definitely take it under consideration. Uh, with that, I'm going to end today's program, and I look forward to seeing you at future Catsonet events.